Now to the Middle East. And Palestinians have begun marking Ramadan, the Islamic month of fasting, while fierce battles continue between Israeli forces and Hamas fighters in Gaza. Let's cross live to Jerusalem and join my colleague Anna Foster. Anna. Samantha, thank you. Good morning. Welcome to uh, Damascus Gate in the city walls here in uh, East Jerusalem where people uh, have begun marking the first day of Ramadan. You can see people moving around. This is one of the places uh, in East Jerusalem that uh, Palestinians often come at this time of year. But of course, many of them because a humanitarian ceasefire could be reached by the beginning of Ramadan, but that hasn't happened, even though channels of communication still remain open. And this is, of course, the holiest month in the Islamic calendar. It's where Muslims fast from sunrise to sunset, normally, of course, breaking that fast with an iftar meal at the end of the day. But in Gaza, it's going to be a very different Ramadan this time round. The United Nations have warned of potential mass starvation there. They say that 25 percent of the population are at risk of mass starvation at the moment. And they say the Hamas-run health uh, ministry in Gaza says that 23 people have died so far of malnutrition, and they say that the majority of those are children. Now, I just want to show you these pictures from al Mawasi in eastern Gaza, and this was people last night marking, uh, or trying to mark at least as best they could, the beginning of uh, Ramadan. You can see the little traditional lanterns there singing their songs and really doing what they could to mark this holy time during a time of war. We fast every Ramadan and we put up decorations five or six days before it starts. We used to be able to get cheese and dairy and filled our fridges with food for the sunset iftar and the sunrise suhoom meals with meat. But now we can't even break our fast with a can of peas or beans since we can't find any in the first place. With thanks to God, even with our empty bellies, we will fast to satisfy our Lord. We talked about the fighting still continuing and the fact that that humanitarian ceasefire has not been achieved by now. And in fact, even just in the last day or two, we've seen the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu responding to comments front invasion of Rafah right at the southern end of the Strip, where more than a million Palestinians are now sheltering. And Mr Netanyahu said that that, that invasion would still happen. Uh, he didn't give a time. Chief Israel's stated aim, his stated aim, of trying to remove Hamas fully from Gaza. There's also an aid ship that's uh, on the way. Now, again, we've talked in the last few days about attempts to try and get aid into Gaza by sea. There's a ship in Cyprus which is due to inaugurate this new maritime aid corridor between Cyprus and Gaza, which has been established by the EU, the UK, US and others. That ship's still in port in Larnaca in Cyprus at the moment. It's been loaded over the last few days. We were told it was due to set off over the weekend, but seems to have uh, met delays and is still in port at the moment. But let's talk a little more about those attempts to get that badly needed aid to civilians in Gaza who need it. I'm joined by Dr. Sarah. Thank you for joining us here on BBC News. What's your assessment of the way that aid is getting into Gaza at the moment? Clearly not enough. How could and should it be more efficient? Absolutely. We are far from enough aid. So aid agencies estimate that we would need about 600 trucks a day to cross into Gaza for sufficient supplies. In February, it was about 100 trucks a day, so very, very far from what is needed for food, medical items, but also shelter items, tents, tarps and so on. So there is very, very high need. And we've seen different attempts now to meet this need. We've seen some airdrops, first from the Jordanian Air Force, but now also the American Air Force. Those look good, yes, absolutely, and they are obviously helping, but they are very, very small volume if you're comparing it to what is actually needed. So bringing in aid by sea sounds great because that vessel that's currently in Cyprus is carrying about 200 tonnes of materials. So that would be very much needed. But it is also then plagued with the same issues of onward transportation. OK, you're docking that ship somewhere, but how is the aid actually going to reach people? And that is a much larger issue. It's interesting what you were saying there. You just little things I noticed you saying about things that look good or sound great but don't necessarily provide the volume of aid needed. Seemingly the best way to do that is to go back to the way that things were before the war and to allow aid in by road. But just remind us why that isn't happening. 
definitely bringing in aid by road is the most efficient way of doing this. But at the moment, we only have two border crossings that are open, both in the south of Gaza, and they are quite limited in what is being let through. You need to have permission to bring goods across. And for some goods, that permission is being withheld from, uh, with the, uh, by the Israeli authorities. And of course, it's then also a question of getting it across. There's lots of checks on the goods. And then also the distribution within Gaza has been very difficult because, of course, the infrastructure is being destroyed. The people are not there. Communications are very, very difficult. Internet availability in Gaza is quite touch and go. It's not there very often. And it is a very, very dangerous situation as well. We saw that a little while ago with people being shot who were receiving aid. It is an extremely difficult environment to try and distribute aid in. Road would be best and road will be the onward transportation for no matter how we get aid into Gaza, but it is extremely challenging at the moment. We've heard uh, world leaders pushing repeatedly for what they call a humanitarian ceasefire. How would that change the picture on the ground in terms of actually getting that aid in? The ability to travel more freely within Gaza and to be able to access areas and not be shot at, that would, of course, be a huge difference. And it also makes a difference to people receiving the aid if they are able to go towards where convoys are going without fear of being at the receiving end of airstrikes, of bullets. So it would make a huge difference here to have the ceasefire, also to just be able to access different areas of Gaza. It's been very, very difficult to get anything into the north of Gaza. So that's been a real big worry for aid agencies. The south of Gaza is also very difficult because so many people are compacted into a very, very small area. So it's quite difficult to reach them and to make sure that it's not just the strongest people who are getting aid, but everybody who needs it can receive it. So a ceasefire would help immensely to get aid to people who so desperately need it. Dr. Sarah Schiffling, thank you uh, for joining us. Appreciate your time here on BBC News. It is a, a beautiful morning here in East Jerusalem, very peaceful at the moment. Different scenes to some of the videos we uh, started to see circulating on social media last night inside the old city there in the, uh, the, the channels that lead towards the Al-Aqsa Mosque compound. We saw some scuffles between security forces and, and younger Palestinians who were trying to get in there to pray. Uh, much more to come from here in East Jerusalem uh, throughout the day here on BBC News. But for now, it's back to Samantha in London. Anna, thank you.